Greetings from Jakarta, Indonesia. Assalamualaikum. Good afternoon. Ming Larba. Welcome to the Indonesian Solidarity for Myanmar Seminar organized by the ASEAN people for the Myanmar people in solidarity with the Myanmar people who have resisted the attempted coup in the past two years. This seminar is called Two Years of Resistance, Assessing Regional Responses in Addressing the Crisis in Myanmar. I'm here with the organizers of the seminar and the host, Jendra Law School. We would like to thank the Jendra Law School for providing the venue for this hybrid seminar, as well as the main organizer is that contrast well, with the other organizers. We have many of them. But I'm proud to say that these are the Indonesian Civil Society along with the regional civil society. It is the actual the organizers of the seminar, along with the contrast, are progressive voice, Aksan Burma, Asia Justice and Rights, or known as AJAR, CPUs, World Alliance for Citizen Participation, ASEAN Parliamentarians for Human Rights, or APHR, Asia Democracy Network, or ADR, ABN, Initiative for International Dialogue. WIT, Asian Forum for Human Rights Development, Amnesty International Division. My name is Adelina Kama, and I'm pleased to invite the moderator of the event, Ms. Fatia. Ms. Fatia Maludianti as the coordinator of contrast to start the discussion and invite. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Adelina, and good afternoon for the Federal Law School and then also to everyone that is in uh, also in. Uh, I am the uh, coordinator of contrast currently working for the issue of human rights in Indonesia and working a lot together with the Myanmar colleagues as well, and then also working in the uh, regional level. That um, very pleasure for me to actually um, will um, having a discussion together with all a very uh, wonderful and then very amazing um, uh, resource persons and uh, speakers here uh, around us and i would like to actually invite uh, our online speak offline speaker which is uh, let me see mr irfan hutagalung uh, mr irfan hutagalung is uh, an international law lecturer from Jenkara Law School who has more than 14 years of experience in drafting legislation Assessing draft laws, teaching law, consulting, and and legal uh, research with uh, major expertise in constitutional law, statutory law, international human rights law, or international humanitarian law. He had an experience as a trainer to design regulations for public employees, including members of the People's Representative Council, Regional Representative Council, Regional People's Representative Council. Uh, Secretary General Staff in uh, DPR, and then also uh, Secretary General Staff in GPD, and Legal Advisor, uh, Legal Division Staff of various Indonesian Ministries, Judicial Commission, National Development Planning Agency, or BAPNAS, and many more government uh, agencies. And next one from our um, international speakers that um, uh, here with us online, Mr. Dato Saifuddin Abdullah. Mr. Saifuddin is a progressive politician who advocates new politics, youth empowerment, and social entrepreneurship. He has also served as the president of the Malaysian Youth Council, a member of the United Nations Secretary General High Level Panel on Youth em uh, Employment, 
Consultant of the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, or ASCAP, and Joint Secretary of Bosnia Action Front. He was also a passionate student activist. And the next one, Ms. Tinzar Sunlehi. Ms. Tinzar is a youth advocate and activist based in Yangon. Sunlehi is also known for her tireless activism for peace and justice campaigning against ongoing civil war in Myanmar over 2012-2018-2016, uh, she coordinated the led nationwide and regional youth forum in Myanmar, as well as the national youth development policy process. The first woman coordinator of the National Youth Congress, or NYC, and a two-term president of the Yangon Youth Network, Finley is also an advocacy lead at ASEAN Youth Peace Network, or AYPN. And the next one, this is also my very best colleague, uh, Miss Yasmin Ula. Yasmin Ula is a Rohingya feminist, author, poet, and also a social justice activist. She was born in the northern Rakhine state of Myanmar. Her family fled to Thailand in 1995 when she was a child, and she remained a refugee until moving to Canada in 20, uh, 2011. Yasmin served as the president of um, uh, in 2018 to 2020, of the Rohingya Human Rights Activist Network, a nonprofit group led by activists across Canada advocating a raising public awareness of the Rohingya genocide. She was elected chair of the ASEAN Burma Board for a one year effective in September 2022, and she is a member of the US campaign for Burma. So, very welcome. And then the last one, this is also my very best colleague as well, Ms. Kin Omar. Kin Omar is a Burmese uh, human rights and democracy activist. Her focus area of work of, of, of for democracy in Burma, including leadership building of youth and women, women empowerment and peace building, human rights protection and defending, advocacy and campaign. And Kin Omar had various regional and international forums, including the UN Human Rights Council. In 28, she also, in 28, she also was awarded with the Anna Lin Award, named for assassinated Swedish foreign, which is awarded annually to a woman or a young person with the courage to divide indifference, prejudice, oppression, and injustice in order to promote a good life for all people in an environment made by respect for human, for human rights. As well as 2018, when she was received another reward for the International Young Women Peace Award by Democracy Today in America. So, yeah. yeah. And Ms. Adelina Kamara, Kamal is, is a senior researcher in ICS, a human rights, human rights humanitarian practitioner, and former executive director uh, in AHA Center. Right? Oh, okay. okay. All right. So let's continue uh, to our discussion now. The first one would be uh, Ms. Yasmin Ula. I would like to give the floor to you to discuss about what is actually your hope and then what is your actually uh, would like to say to the Indonesian government as the new chair of ASEAN right now, since we know um, for the last five years or more, uh, ASEAN already have this kind of situation of Myanmar as one of the conflict area in ASEAN. But, but I think that or other colleagues in ASEAN also think that uh, ASEAN governments are not really able to actually uh, settle the situation of conflict in Myanmar, the refugee issues, and all of the human rights issues in ASEAN. And what do you think that the ASEAN governments and include specifically to Indonesia as the chair of ASEAN right now to actually um, combat the situation and then how to settle the human rights relations and the coup d'etat that currently happen in Myanmar. So uh, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Yasmin. The floor is yours. I just cannot um, turn on the video. Is there a way for me to do this? Um, can you can you guys hear me at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can continue. It's okay. Um, should I turn on the video, or is it just the voice? Uh, whatever you prefer. So it's fine. I I think that the host need to allow me to actually start the video. Host. 
Yeah. Um, it, it says you cannot start your video because right, the host is on. Okay, 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 you can, you can start, start now. now. All right, okay. Okay, you can see me now, yes? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Um, my name is Yasmin, I'm a Rohingya human rights activist as um, uh, um, Fatia has kindly introduced me. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that um, I am currently um, in the unceded traditional territory of the Ketsi, Semiamo, Kwantlen, and other Coast Salish peoples. Unceded means that the land was never surrendered or given up and that I and others on this land are working, living, and operating on a stolen land. Um, I'm very honored to be here among you all, of course, with a heavy heart um, of the current struggle that's been ongoing. Um, but I, I'd like to, since I, you know, had the, the honor to actually kickstart the event, um, I'd like to frame the conversation around resistance today. Um, and I would like to point out that it, it has not just been two years. Um, it has been decades and decades for Rohingya and other ethnic communities as a whole in terms of resistance against injustice, systemic you know, oppression, and institutionalized um, discrimination um, against us. Our continued existence today is a testament to that very difficult work of survival and communal care. Um, what Myanmar Junta has designed for Rohingya is not only to inflict pain upon us, but to make us out to be an example for any further retaliation or any hopes for fully functioning democracy. The end goal of Rohingya genocide is our complete annihilation as we know it, but it's not just in a physical sense. It is also in the cultural, historical, economic, social, and political sense. When tyrants set out to destroy a community, they do not just kill or violate the group of people. They also do everything to erase the memory of the people and the communities. So we see the savoring of the ties. We see you know, the evidence today in Myanmar um, where a lot of the community's uh, ties, especially in the ethnic sense, um, has been weakened. And the strength and our ability to create more social cohesion also wavered. Um, however, you know, there, there is um, also a, a conversation that actually help emphasize or, or, or um, goes into creating more of that issue, which is where when, when, when um, discussing Myanmar, uh, Burma, I constantly witness the divorcing of Rohingya genocide as the issue from the collective crisis across Myanmar. And, and the two are not mutually exclusive. The two need to be addressed together. Um, and I would like to point out that it is at the very least an incomplete approach to do so, you know, to divorce the two issues. And um, the problem that stems from, you know, cultural and ideological impunity in which perpetrators in power are often not held accountable by those within the country regionally or internationally, um, this is this is where uh, uh, we need to focus our approach um, to actually be a bit deeper than just superficial level. And um, to further highlight the struggles within the Rohingya community to expand, you know, on on, you know, what the resistance for the past two years um, has meant. Last year was dubbed the deadliest year for Rohingya at sea with a very conservative number by UN agencies um, of 180 people uh, being the victims of drowning. What is not said in these conservative numbers, um, in these reportings, is that a lot of the drowning were a result of some other failure in the regional and international response, especially in securing some livelihood within the largest refugee camps in the world, in Cox's Bazar. Over a million people have pretty much been left to their own device, no food, no water, no prospect, no hope. Um, how long could parents actually watch their children out of school and live in dire situation where human insecurity issues 
are never really adequately addressed? This is just some you know, questions that every one of us can actually empathize with. This is where Rohingya takes Perilis journey um, because really, can you blame them for looking for a chance to find something better by risking everything that they have left? Another solemn reminder of where this all began is, is that um, just at the end of last year in December, uh, five years after the world had witnessed the crimes of genocide in full view, 37 Rohingya girls, young girls, um, who were imprisoned without a trial for violating the mobility restrictions and apartheid-like rules around movements were released after two long years of imprisonment in, in the prison Patain. Um, the youngest prisoner was four years old. Let that sink in. I, I really have no words after, you know, learning this. But let me let me ask this rather emotional question um, as to why and in what world could we fathom a toddler being incarcerated for being a Rohingya? And, and don't get me wrong, the crime is not that we are too stubborn to stay where we were told. Uh, these unreasonable punitive measures, among many others, were by design created to choke us until our last breath. Um, it is to squeeze us so hard that we would try to leave, but then when we do leave, we get thrown into jail for trying to flee. That is the very reality of Rohingya in Arakan. And as I empathize with my colleagues and my fellow people from Burma and Myanmar, I plead to Indonesia and regional groups to not forget where this all started. Ignoring the plight of Rohingya, does not make it go away. If you do not want us to have to burden you with fleeing to your respective nations, act accordingly. Act in the interest of justice and accountability. The attempted coup we see today was not something many of us in the civil society could not have predicted. It was predicted for a very, very, you know, from, from various different organizations. Rohingya advocates for decades also have been pleading um, that the danger of allowing the junta to do what they want for small economic interest, you know, compared to how unstable the region becomes later on, will eventually spread across Burma, Myanmar. And this is not an I told you so type of moments, but it is, it bears, you know, repeating. Um, reminders is good sometimes. Failure to act leads to an even more difficult, complex and long-term crisis. As much as this has been a rather gloomy reminder, I would like to also emphasize that there is a window of opportunity here, um, especially with Indonesia being the chair being the chair of ASEAN. So work with us. Help us first by asking how best you can contribute to uh, long-term sustainable solutions to this effort to topple over the military institution and ideology and the effort to build a federalized nation. One key issue that I believe my colleagues will certainly shed light on is the sham election that is being held by the junta in the name of democracy. Democracy. There can be no democracy while the military have their boots on our neck to choose them to run the country. I know that my community will continue to survive. I know the strength that we have, but we cannot fix this by ourselves. It should not fall solely on victims' shoulders to find a way out of this mess, the mess that we've collectively created. One clear manifestation of Rohingya people's strength is that we survived through seven decades of repressive policies and systemic violence. Our ability to survive alone should tell you everything about our willingness to resist the authoritarian regime and our goal to keep the community together. We have past the point of no return. The military does not want what is best for us in the country or in the region. It is time we move away from the wishful thinking that we could change, um, we could change them, or that you know they would change, um, or that they're just one negotiation away from stopping the murder and the mass violence against the civilians. 
They've time and time again proven otherwise. So even though today I've rambled on, you know, so critically about the current struggles, regional actors are key um, and are being looked at by the global community to lead. So many state officials that I've spoken to in the West are constantly bringing up ASEAN. And I believe that we can, and, and, and we could, you know, we could do so much more. Um, we can do it well, given the right approach and measures are implemented. One of which is victims and community centered approach. So lastly, it is going to be an emotional plead, um, pleading to all of you as a Rohingya who was born in Arakan and had to leave for reasons beyond my control. I wish for a day that we no longer have to convince everyone, especially those in power, that we are human enough to not be abused, that we deserve to be protected and that no human should ever go through what we have. Thank you for your attention. Please give a round of applause for Ms. Yasmin Ola for such a, a good speech and then also how we could, one most important thing from here that I can see, um, sometimes we are forget whether the coup that is not only about how Myanmar has failed um, their democracy and how the situation already happened for two years, but it's actually more than a decade, more than five decades that the Rohingyas people, and then how it's all started when the Myanmar government actually failed to actually um, making an enjoyment for the Rohingyas. So some people like Yasmin here or the other people in Aceh right now, the poor people and the refugees are now strangled and then they don't have their own rights to actually and enjoy what we have now. So one of the things that uh, we can see from here that ASEAN is already like one of the oldest uh, regional organization that is owned by the, the, uh, the government. And then the government initiated ASEAN as one of the um, like a common goal, like a common uh, values, how we are in ASEAN actually uh, could work together in development, but also in human rights. However, in the uh, ASEAN doesn't have a very clear and a very strong human rights mechanism or human rights standard that could actually, um, you know, facilitate those kind of human rights violation impunity that already happened in the region for a long, long time. We have a very common issue in ASEAN as well, which is an impunity and authoritarian regime. But the question is, which country in ASEAN that already passing those times and already succeeded to actually settling the gross human rights violations, the impunity, and how we could actually working together as ASEAN, actually dismantling all the situation of abuse and all violence and conflict that happened in ASEAN region. In fact, Myanmar now is already there. And I don't think that the regional uh, government actually already succeeded to actually settling the situation in Myanmar. And I would like to uh, give the floor to the second speaker. Um, Mr. Saifuddin Abdullah. Uh, since we know that ASEAN um, mechanism of human rights is super weak, um, in my opinion, and then also how the situation in uh, Rohingya is right now. And then what do you think as a very um, a prominent person, you are also a student activist back there and seeing a lot of activists, human rights defenders in Myanmar now also become subjected of violence or even being executed. And how the Rohingya situation and also being failed to actually uh, have a solution in the international forums, like in, uh, in the UN or in the other um, international uh, forum, not like the other conflict areas like Ukraine, for example. What do you think that we can do as a, stu as a student activist? Since I know that there are a lot of uh, student activists also here. And what do you think that the ASEAN should do? And the care, of course, Indonesia uh, is tackling this kind of situation of rest villages. So for Mr. Saifuddin, uh, the floor is yours. 
Hi, uh, assalamu alaikum. I just want to check, uh, can, can you hear me? Is it okay to go? Yeah, yeah, yeah. we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, assalamu alaikum and uh, a good day, good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Firstly, let me thank the organizer for inviting me uh, to this uh, webinar. This is a very timely discussion. Uh, we are a few days away before a full two year of the coup d'etat uh, that has been uh, done by the military junta uh, of, of uh, Myanmar. Uh, within this past two years, uh, a lot of thing uh, has occurred. One one thing for sure is that uh, more than eighteen thousand uh, clashes and attacks have occurred within Myanmar. Uh, more and more Myanmar people are now internally displaced. Uh, more and more people fled the country, and I empathize with uh, Yasmin. Uh, more and more Rohingyas are now fleeing uh, the country. Uh, well, more than 2,600 civilians were killed. More than 1,600 civilians were arrested. And uh, we can go on uh, and on with the numbers. Uh, for ASEAN as an organization, I think we have not been doing enough. When I was foreign minister, I was probably, uh, well, some people probably don't really like me for saying so much, like uh, ASEAN needs to have a real sense of urgency. Uh, we have lots of meetings on Myanmar, but more and more people are killed between our, in between the meetings. We have to have real understanding of what is happening. And for us to know what is really happening on the ground, you definitely cannot rely on uh, Nepido uh, for information or Yangon. You have to rely and speak and engage people on the ground, the NGOs, uh, and of course the NUG, the NUCC, and all the other groupings. Uh, I agree with Yasmin and many others who believe that this year is very, very important. On the one hand, because Indonesia is chair and of ASEAN and we know Ibu Retno and Pak Jokowi are very passionate on the issue. Uh, Ibu Retno as foreign minister, if not herself, at least her team has met the NUG, the NUC, and UCC and the other stakeholders. I have met the NUG, the NUCC and the other stakeholders more than once. And I openly announced that I have met them. And I think it is about time that ASEAN engage uh, the NUG, the NUCC and the other stakeholders. It's very, very important. Uh, never mind if this is not really about recognition, but engaging. Uh, the only, for now, the only democratically elected uh, platform uh, by the people of Myanmar is of absolute importance. The least we can do to the Myanmar people is recognize the fact that they had an election and they had a government. Uh, because it is really not helping when ASEAN is saying, no, we do not recognize the junta, but at the same time, we're not even talking uh, to uh, the government uh, that was uh, elected by the people of Myanmar in a very democratic, open, transparent, fair election. Now, but besides ASEAN, there are also the other players. Uh, there is uh, China, uh, there is the EU, there is the UN uh, and others. All of us have to play our role. And I must say uh, that in the last two years, 
we probably have not played uh, the kind of role that is expected uh, from us by the people of Myanmar. So for ASEAN, I believe the next step or forward is really to engage the NUG, the NUCC, and the other stakeholders. Um, we have to ensure that the junta's proposed election this year is blocked. Uh, we, we, we must try our level best not to allow this to happen. And even if it happened, uh, we should not, and we must not recognize uh, the junta election. There is this story about the five-point consensus. Uh, to many of us, there is no real progress. Even on the humanitarian assistance, uh, that is why uh, I had I have uh, on behalf of the NUG, the current national union, the Chin uh, National Party, and the Karani National Progressive Party. Uh, they wrote a letter to the ASEAN uh, to propose the formation of an inclusive humanitarian donor forum. And I must thank uh, Adelina, uh, our former chief of uh, AHA Center, for writing a very comprehensive report on what is happening on the ground as far as humanitarian assistance is concerned. Uh, there's no two way about it. Uh, we have to work with people that is trusted by the Myanmar people. Uh, and the idea of the Humanitarian Donor Forum is to allow uh, organizations and donors to contribute uh, directly, uh, of course, uh, with the facilitation of uh, ASEAN, for example. Uh, I mean, they told me that uh, the they, they expect the UN SG special envoy and ASEAN special envoy to 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 start the work uh, in establishing the uh, humanitarian donor forum but definitely uh, you know uh, not to allow the junta as now what is happening uh, uh, to to control uh, the the humanitarian assistance now the five point consensus i think uh, minister uh, foreign minister of of uh, nug was very polite when she told me she think that the five point consensus is not sufficient uh, i think what she actually mean is uh, they don't really they don't recognize the, the the five point consensus they know from day one that it's not going to work but of course uh, since the asean leaders have agreed on this and the last summit uh reiterated the fact that the five-point consensus must be implemented, then uh, we have uh, mooted uh, last year the idea of a proper framework with a clear end game in the implementation of the five-point consensus. And the end game is really the return of democracy uh, for the Myanmar people. And uh, just now I talked about uh, the, the election, the sham election, uh, election uh, to the NUG, you don't have to do it now because uh, there was already this election uh, in in the in, in the end of uh, at the end of 2021. But even if there will be election in the future, it has to be an election that is agreed upon all uh, by all people uh, that uh, with a new election system and not the, the not the election system and procedures that the junta is now. Uh, trying to amend uh, by their own. Uh, uh, this is definitely not the kind of election system or procedures that we should allow to be implemented. It has to be an election system, uh, laws or procedures that is agreed upon uh, by uh, the NUG, NUCC and, and the other stakeholders. Uh, and of course, for the Rohingya, uh, among the things, that we should do, I, I believe, under the framework uh, that has a clear end game is to uh, to resolve the issue of citizenship. So the citizenship of uh, Act of 1982, uh, uh, you know, I think should be abolished and uh, Rohingyans should be 
uh, officially recognized uh, as uh, you know rightful citizen uh, of Myanmar as uh, they have been uh, there for hundreds of years. Now, coming back to the humanitarian assistance, uh, last year, Malaysia organized a conference on uh, the rights to education for refugee children. And the, we, together with the OIC, I understand that uh, the OIC is really thinking seriously about doing more, uh, including uh, funding of uh, not only Rohingya, uh, other uh, uh, what you call refugees, uh, uh, children of refugees. Uh, now, the international community must work together uh, to stop military assistance to the junta. You can call it sanction, you can call it whatever, but we cannot continue to supply assets and weapons uh, and equipments and the fuel that is used to fly the, uh, you know, the the aeroplanes uh, that bomb uh, the, 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 the Myanmar people, including we have seen on videos how students uh, have to run uh, for cover uh, during their classes and so on and so forth. Now, let me conclude by uh, saying a few things. Number one, uh, we, we must be really serious about uh, helping about, sorry, about facilitating uh, the people of Myanmar. Uh, they are the one uh, who is fighting very hard. Uh, I know there are factions, uh, different, different groupings. But uh, from my little understanding, uh, they have done uh, very well in talking to each other. Uh, the unity among the pro-democracy movement uh, uh, of Myanmar and those who are anti-junta uh, is, is really... Uh, you know, uh, very good, and and we cannot fail them. Uh, we we really have to put our act together. Uh, don't ask them to do any more. Uh, uh, getting their act together, I think they have put their act together. Uh, all of them, including the ethnic groups, uh, uh, the PDF, whatever. Uh, they they are doing uh, all uh, that they can, and uh, it is really uh, something uh, that others may think impossible. All. Uh, ASEAN and the international community must do is to support, to facilitate with, with a lot more uh, urgency and, and, and commitment. Uh, number two, uh, we have to, you know, ASEAN have to, I know this is really a problem. Uh, sometimes uh, we work on consensus and getting consensus uh, sometimes can be difficult. Uh, it is even regretful that a particular country or four uh, ASEAN members, if I'm not mistaken, uh, convene what is now known as the non-ASEAN meeting. Uh, that is really hurtful. Uh, we, we, we should not have done that, but it's done. And, and I think uh, we should not repeat uh, this kind of uh, action. You are really demoralizing uh, the real people that needs to be uh, supported. So uh, finally, I would say uh, uh, I, I, I fully understand that the movement uh, among the people of Myanmar, uh, they are very, very committed. Uh, they, they, they dare do anything, if I can put it that way. Uh, it is really up to us to ensure that we do not fail them. Uh, and uh, it is our duty, uh, it is our moral uh, to, to be in solidarity with them and uh, to support them uh, in the best of ways. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Saifuddin. And yeah, a lot of actually uh, statements that is actually very strong. And then I hope that there is someone from the Indonesian government or from the ASEAN government could actually listen to what you've been saying. And Yasmin already 
uh, saying as well about their concerns because it's actually very fruitful and consensus is not actually as you know the privilege of the ASEAN government but it could be a consensus and then also the agreements should be reflecting on the needs of our people itself so when we are talking about the consensus of five points consensus uh, we should actually questioning the government again whether those points those situations, those agreements, are they already reflecting and then also representing the people? ASEAN is about the people. ASEAN is about how they could have a lot of growth, a lot of development, a lot of um, things that are being, uh, you know, claimed as their achievement by the government of ASEAN to the other regional or international level. Or uh, is it only um, being part of the government or how the people actually contribute to this lot of achievement in ASEAN? And there are a lot of things that should be uh, evaluated, uh, I think. Like, for example, how the conflict situation happened and then how it should be um, discussed and not only talking about economic issue, but also about human rights issues as a priority. Because we see that a lot of conflicts happen in Myanmar uh, and then other issues like Papua or Cambodia and other uh, situations in Patani and Mindanao, for, for instance, that ASEAN never has a lot of urgency feelings, urgency stance that usually could become one of the priority topics that could be discussed by the ASEAN government. And how ASEAN could also listen more to the people, how they could should be engaged to the NUG and other um, people's representative. And then recognizing the election that coming from the people, not coming from the junta. I mean, it could be a very great and a very bold move. And it's it's one of the achievements that if, could, uh, if the ASEAN government actually could do something about it and could have a very strong statement related to uh, the situation of conflict and ASEAN. Okay, okay. I'll stop there and then I would like to continue to our next um, uh, speaker, Ms. Sinzar Sunlayi. Uh, she is also a youth um, activist based in um, uh, are talking about a lot of situation of democracy in Myanmar. So I would like to give the floor to Ms. Sinzar. Can you say hi? Okay. You're there. Okay. okay. Yeah, we can listen to you. Okay. I'll give you 10 minutes to share your thoughts and then also your hope to the new ASEAN chairmanship and then also what is actually missing from the uh, regional level um, commitments and then international level commitments to, to discuss more about the situation in Myanmar. So the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so... Uh, Assalamu alaikum and also minglawa to our friends near and far. Um, now I'm presenting my new look. You know, um, people might not recognize me for how I look right now, but I think it is important that um, we change look and why would we just dwell on the past look? You know, I think that would be the same for the ASEAN five point consensus. When it is a failed consensus, why would you just dwell on the old look? You need a new look. <laughs> so, yeah, first, I think um, uh, I would like to acknowledge the current presence of the fact that now we are all here together again for Myanmar and for the people of Myanmar. It's been over 720 days, precisely 17,280 hours that we all were terrorized by the Myanmar military through their attempt to rule the country. At the same time, it's also two years, 730 days, 17 thousand and two hundred eighty hours that we also put efforts time energy our life our properties our jobs and most of the revolutionaries on the ground also have invested all their life even their coming generation into this um today our news feed you know all news headlines may skip what is happening in Myanmar after a two-year long struggle but the reality is we can't ignore that the fact that the military criminals inside the country, they are not stopping. They are not stopping a day. They are not just harassing, brutalizing, or terrorizing revolutionaries, people inside the country. They are also occupying our digital space for all of us 
um, by shutting down the internet, cutting off the telecommunications lines, blogging, the aids and transportation, granting themselves a right to invade uh, our houses at midnight. That violates the right to privacy, not just in our premises and also on digital platforms, even along the borders in Thailand, India, and China. So the military in Myanmar is conducting not just political coup, but also digital coup, and imposing threat to the Asia Pacific region nowadays by cooperating with aggressive invaders such as um, Russian army. On this day, I personally reflect, and I also recall the questions I got asked by different people in the past years that, why would you risk everything uh, to protest this? And they say they all, you always have the options to remain silent and just submit to them, like so that military won't intimidate any of us, any of any of you. So that was a question um, asked by many people in the past few years. I wish we were that cowardly. And this is also, I think, is very that very mentality that inspire many more dictators around the world. And this is how impunity continues, that we stay silent, that we stay submit to the, to the perpetrators. So this is also not how we teach our generations. This is not how we build uh, the nation, just by submitting to the perpetrators. And this is not how we teach our kids at home or school. We say to our nieces or daughters that when they are rapists who try to attack you, we say well, you attack back and defend yourself because that's your right to such defense. And we say we will do everything we can to hold these perpetrators accountable. We don't say our daughter that on the spot you demand perpetrator to release you or you negotiate for so-called consensus. No, no, we don't. So for us, the only option is to resist the attempt to ruin the military and build a new federal democratic nation. I think it's important that we repeat our cause, our demand, and very reason why we are why we are who we are today, to all of uh, our region and partner, to everyone who are supporting, who are trying to solve the case. So today, in this space, we must celebrate the bravery and resilience of the people within more than seven hundred days. It's not just the day that we talk about the brutalist, the, uh, the military hunters imposing on us, but also our bravery and resilience. We stay exit. The civil society stay operate on the ground, stay organized. The strikes are every day on the ground. And this is, this is the day that we should celebrate these bravery and resilience. They remain undoubted and determined to work on the path for a long-term solution, saying no to quit phases or even returning to state quo. I would say, as long as the resistance is there, the coup attempt will never be success. The spring revolutions, one of the main motto is they shall never rule us. This may sound familiar to you because this is the same spirit of the ethnic revolutionaries resisting the military occupation invasions in their territories nearly a century ago. Like many of us, we live with this reality every hour that we're not giving up our roadmaps toward federal democratic nation where justice and human rights are soft for all of us. Also, the military in Myanmar are also not giving up until, uh, and they are pursuing their roadmap to rule the country. So people asked, when these roadmaps will meet on the way? My answer is, when justice prevail. The military in Myanmar now lack the support of its own people, its own soldiers, its own generation, lack legitimacy, to rule the country and lack the political will or capacity to be able to rule the country at peace. The military as an institution has failed to serve the people and conduct its own mission, turning itself into a fascist institution or criminals. Like it or not, as long as the military remain in political position, attempting to rule, attempting to power over us, there will be continued resistance and conflict prolonged in Myanmar. The military in Myanmar now stands as an institution to be held accountable, not a political stakeholder. To date, the regional response to the Myanmar crisis is not as daring as the people of Myanmar. They themselves are now experiencing the brutalities. That clearly lay out the fact that governments in the region are not wide aware of the danger that the military is imposing in our region. 
The five point consensus is one of the example in place that the government and regions are not actually helping to find the solution of the crisis or pretending that it's fixing the crisis by just looking at the tips of the iceberg. Five point consensus does not represent the Myanmar people. That's hardly not why people are still sacrificing their life for. Government may make mistakes. ASEAN may make mistakes. People may make mistakes. But the fact right now in 2023 is, would these governments be willing to admit their failure, that failure, the five-point consensus failure, and correct the course for a long-term sustainable solution? That's what we are counting on the Indonesia government as the chairman of the ASEAN. Would they be willing to do it? Myanmar people still keep on marching every day, protesting for just and accountability. Myanmar people are still revolving for a long-term solution, a people-led political roadmap towards genuine federal democracy. I repeat, a people-led political roadmap towards genuine federal democracy. So last year, in, before Christmas in the border town, Mesot, the Thai army detained seven civil disobedience movement members, including five defender soldiers, different ranks, and they investigated them for five hours. They were not likely deported, but they are told that they are now being watched and asked to remain under watch. This signal to all of us, all the people shattering along the borders that there will be more threats of arrest and raiding in the thai Burma border this year. And we know that many unknown low profile anonymous revolutionaries are being deported to Myanmar and in the hands of the Myanmar military. Refugees shattering along the border remain and a different mental or physical threat from one dictator to another. The border bridge is now open to Myanmar and Thailand, activists, politicians, shattering along the borders. People finally compromising their security concerns because that's a clear sign that the border authorities are now escalated their cooperation. Many activists live in these and confirm rumors that the Thai army is doing targeted political arrests today, tomorrow, the next day. Many people are now barred to exit Thailand to relocate resettled in third countries too. And also the UNHCR supposed to help the refugee are not doing enough. Instead, uh, they are they are responses to the inquiries and the resettlements planning need more uh, human to human treatment human to human treatment to avoid adding more traumas to the people. So here are my three recommendations to this year ASEAN chairman Indonesia and the member state of ASEAN, including UN entities that um, first to acknowledge that the five point consensus has failed and the main online hunter is not a reliable partner. ASEAN should abandon the five point consensus in its present form and negotiate a new agreement on the crisis in Myanmar with the NUG, National Unity Government, and the representative of EAO's ethnic revolutionary organization, provide agreement, a new agreement that with an enforced mechanism, enforcement mechanism. Second, I think it's important that we gain more power to the pro-democracy movement in the country by showing online and offline solidarity, political aid, support to the activists, CDM, and to the survivor, survivors and by granting asylum and gave legal protection to the refugee fleeing Myanmar, including Rohingyas and members of the ethnic groups who fled before the coup. Because, you know, the military has been conducting all these oppressions way before the coup in different ethnic states. The third and the last but not the least recommendation from me is hold the perpetrator accountable in Myanmar, also in each of your country and impunity in our region by not cooperating with the criminal junta in Myanmar and true and, and also serving uh, for justice through all justice, available justice mechanisms in the region. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Very much, Ms. Binzar is such a, a very strong statement as well. And then also a very uh, bold recommendation yeah. that I hope that we here could amplify what Ms. Binzar already mentioned about how the refugees also should have uh, a more and then a better uh, treatment from uh, the UNSCR and then other entities as well. 
and then also acknowledge the failure of the five point consensus that is not really represent representing the people and then engage with the NEG and then also CSOs to be more representative, not actually inviting the uh, military junta, but to invite the NUG and also the CSOs to the ASEAN summit. Uh, gain more power at online and offline solidarity. So I hope uh, all people that work in this um, public discussion could actually share your um, concern and then also uh, getting to uh, engage to the solidarity uh, movement of the Myanmar as part of the ASEAN people and then hold the proper status accountable. And this is actually lead to the next question, how the UN and then also the ASEAN itself could actually demand to the international forum or to the NSC to actually have an independent investigation so we could have a new uh, part of the uh, International Criminal Court that it could really happen for Myanmar uh, in the future. So for the next, maybe it's also related to my question, uh, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Irfan here. Uh, so we'll be in the live session now in Jentera. Um, so to Pak Irfan, uh, I would like to uh, actually asking to you whether do you think the international level could actually facilitate um, the situation that happened in Myanmar right now? And then in the perspective of the humanitarian law and the humanitarian uh, perspective, whether this situation in Myanmar, what should the ASEAN do and how the people here could actually help and support to the government, international government, to actually uh, accelerating the process of the inter uh, international humanitarian aid and other support to the Myanmar. Terima kasih atas kesempatan yang diberikan kepada saya. Saya ingin pertama menyampaikan rasa solidaritas yang sangat dalam kepada teman-teman di Myanmar, juga tadi kepada Yasmin ya. Uh, seringkali memang kita, rasanya kita baru secara serius membicarakan Myanmar setelah ada kudeta dan uh, krisis yang mengikutinya. Padahal sebetulnya kita sudah cukup lama melupakan uh, penderitaan Rohingya. Uh, mereka telah menanggung uh, beban penderitaan itu uh, beberapa dekade dan baru kita sadar bahwa begitu kejamnya uh, rejim Junta uh, ini uh, dalam membantai uh, kelompok Myanmar dan teman-teman uh, orang-orang di Myanmar termasuk tentu uh, gerakan uh, penolakan terhadap kudeta dan kepemimpinan dari uh, junta militer yang sekarang kita saksikan. Uh, dari tadi banyak dibicarakan tentang kekecewaan terhadap uh, upaya yang, telah, yang upaya yang dilakukan oleh ASEAN dan juga oleh uh, internasional dalam merespon kekejaman yang dilakukan oleh um, militer di Myanmar. Nah, sebetulnya dalam perspektif hukum internasional itu uh, tidak terlalu sulit untuk dijelaskan. Yang pertama karena dalam UN Charter misalnya, ada prinsip yang sangat luas diterima oleh bangsa-bangsa di dunia bahwa uh, negara lain, termasuk juga UN, tidak dapat uh, mengintervensi urusan dalam negeri dari suatu negara. Itu disebutkan di dalam pasal-pasal awal di UN Charter dan juga beberapa resolusi majelis umum terkait dengan larangan intervensi. Beberapa putusan dari International Court of Justice juga mengamplify larangan untuk intervensi suatu negara, kelompok negara, bahkan UN terhadap Uh, urusan dalam negeri suatu negara. Satu-satunya intervensi yang bisa dilakukan adalah dengan persetujuan dari Dewan Keamanan. Itu pun uh, jika uh, dilakukan dalam kerangka untuk menciptakan kedamaian dunia sebagaimana diamanatkan dalam uh, bab 7 piagam PBB. Yang kedua dari sisi uh, kalau tadi dari sisi hukum internasional secara umum dari dari ASEAN Charter uh, dari uh, PBB atau UN Charter dari 
regional arrangement juga tidak begitu atau bahkan e, semakin mengecewakan ya karena e, larangan intervensi oleh negara atau institusi sebagaimana ASEAN dalam hal ini terhadap anggotanya itu juga disebut dalam e, piagam ASEAN. Memang di dalam piagam ASEAN disebutkan juga bahwa ASEAN berkomitmen untuk menciptakan e, perlindungan terhadap hak asasi manusia, good governance, pemerintahan yang demokratis. Tetapi kita semua tahu bahwa ASEAN tidak punya mekanisme apapun untuk e, mengimplementasikan secara nyata, sungguh-sungguh, dan konkret terhadap apa yang disebut di dalam e, piagam ASEAN. Sesungguhnya, kalau kita bicara terhadap e, reaksi ASEAN atas apa yang terjadi di wilayah negara anggota ASEAN, kita sebetulnya tidak terlalu heran dengan apa yang telah e, kita alami sekarang, ya, di mana ASEAN tidak dapat berbuat apa-apa. Walaupun dalam beberapa hal saya ingin memberikan catatan apa yang telah dibuat oleh ASEAN berkangan ini terhadap isu Myanmar itu e, lumayan cukup maju. Walaupun tentu dengan kalau ukur sikap ASEAN sebelum Nah, kita tahu banyak peristiwa terjadi di ASEAN dan ASEAN tidak bisa berbuat apa-apa misalnya kudeta di Thailand konflik di Mindanao konflik antara Malaysia dengan Filipina di Sabah Rohingya yang sudah bertanggung jika dia tidak dapat perhatian bahkan dari ASEAN dan itu semua e, memang dapat kita pahami karena apa? Karena As ASEAN sesungguhnya didesain atau diciptakan untuk mengkontain komunisme di masa perang ini e, juga dibuat hanya untuk menciptakan kalau sekarang menciptakan upaya pembangunan ekonomi. Jadi eh, ASEAN, mah, 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 ASEAN punya mekanisme yang cukup detail tentang bagaimana mengimplementasikan perjanjian-perjanjian ekonomi, eh, tetapi tidak punya implementasi yang cukup detail bagaimana menyelesaikan, eh, bagaimana mengimplementasikan poin-poin eh, terkait dengan hak asasi manusia, pemerintahan yang demokratis, eh, good governance, dan lain-lain. Sebagaimana juga disebut di dalam ASEAN Charter. Kalau kita lihat eh, reaksi ASEAN terhadap eh, kudeta militer yang dilakukan oleh Myanmar misalnya, tidak ada satupun kenyataan keluar dari ASEAN yang mengkondem, yang menyalahkan atau yang mengutuk tindakan itu. Dan memang dalam rezim hukum internasional juga, di, juga tidak ada aturan yang menyatakan misalnya bahwa pemerintahan itu harusnya demokratis. Dan tidak boleh menggulingkan pemerintahan yang demokratis dengan cara-cara yang tidak demokratis. Tidak ada aturan itu di UN Charter, tentu tidak tidak ada juga itu di di mana di ASEAN Charter. Yang ada adalah memang di UN ada kewajiban dari negara anggota untuk menghormati hak asasi manusia. Dan UN punya mekanisme itu, mekanisme pendekatannya lewat eh, Charter Based Mechanism yang di lakukan oleh Dewan HAM juga yang dilakukan lewat eh, apa kritikis jika negara-negara anggota PBB menandatangani dan mengikuti eh, atau menyatakan menerima eh, mekanisme yang dilakukan oleh komite-komite yang dibentuk oleh kritikis yang dia eh, ratifikasi. Um, memang ada 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 hal yang perlu juga dicatat di sini bahwa internasional mekanisme telah membuat uh, dalam hal ini lewat Dewan Ham membuat uh, special rapporteur terhadap Myanmar dan itu telah, telah beberapa dicatat ya tapi juga tidak begitu banyak yang bisa diharapkan dari special rapporteur karena apa karena mekanisme Ham di UN itu juga ada batasnya di mana kalau ingin menegakkan hak asasi manusia seperti misalnya yang telah dilakukan oleh uh, UN di di apa di Bekasi Selatan misalnya di Rwanda itu memerlukan suatu resolusi yang harus keluar dari Dewan Keamanan. Otherwise itu nggak akan terjadi. 
Jadi saya ingin menyampaikan bahwa dari sistem internasional ada banyak sekali tantangan yang harus diatasi sehingga pelanggaran hak asasi manusia yang oleh Special Rapporteur Myanmar juga dikatakan bahwa apa yang telah terjadi di Myanmar itu telah memenuhi threshold sebagai crime against humanity itu memerlukan banyak langkah dan seringkali berhenti di uh, suatu keputusan yang tidak dapat dilahirkan dari Dewan Keamanan. Nah, saya kembali ke balik lagi sebentar ke ASEAN. Di dalam uh, reaksi ASEAN terhadap apa yang dilakukan atau apa yang telah terjadi di Myanmar, sebetulnya saya ingin memberikan uh, catatan dan yang penting untuk kita ingat dan mudah-mudahan ini terus berkembang, yakni apa? Uh, ASEAN telah berhasil ya membuat lima poin konsensus itu. Nah, ASEAN berhasil membuat lima poin konsensus bersama dengan rezim yang berkuasa. Teman-teman um, mungkin akan berpikir mengapa dia diundang. Saya pikir ada blessing mengapa mereka diundang. Akhirnya apa? Uh, rezim Myanmar ikut menyetujui, ikut mengambil keputusan terhadap lima poin konsensus. Jadi, jadi sistem ASEAN tetap berjalan di mana konsensus tetap dipakai. Dan ketika mereka tidak mampu menjalankannya, dan ketika mereka tidak mau menjalankannya, lebih tepat maksud tidak mau, eh, ASEAN punya alasan untuk tidak menggunakan eh, pemimpin kita. Jadi, jadi ketika poin-poin itu tidak jalan, ketika poin-poin konsensus itu tidak dijalankan oleh Myanmar, oleh kita, ASEAN memiliki suatu mekanisme pemberian sanksi. Jadi selama ini jika teman-teman berpikir bahwa ASEAN tidak punya mekanisme sanksi, kita perlu melihat kembali bahwa dalam konteks ini, ASEAN telah berhasil memberikan sanksi kepada Junta. Dan ini belum pernah terjadi sebelum. Belum pernah terjadi sebelumnya pemimpin eh, eh, dalam suatu ASEAN Summit di mana yang dihadiri oleh pemimpin eh, eksekutif dari negara-negara anggota ASEAN, itu satu orang tidak juga hadir. Karena apa? Karena reaksi eh, dari pemimpin ASEAN yang kecewa terhadap eh, pemimpin yang tidak diundang tadi karena apa? Karena dia tidak melaksanakan apa yang diminta oleh ASEAN Sambang. Nah, saya berharap bahwa Indonesia, kepemimpinan Indonesia pada setahun ini mampu mengembangkan semacam sanksi yang lebih konkret lagi. Dan ini tentu tidak eh, tidak apa? Tidak berarti tidak ada perlawanan dari dari Myanmar sendiri ya karena Myanmar bilang bahwa apa yang telah dilakukan oleh ASEAN kemarin itu melanggar uh, apa melanggar konsensus, melanggar uh, prinsip uh, campur tangan, uh, mendiskriminasi uh, mereka karena uh, apa keputusan ASEAN itu harus konsensus, kami tidak diundang dan seterusnya. Jadi uh, tetap ada perlawanan, tapi Indonesia dalam kehidupan sekarang dia punya cukup alasan untuk membuat langkah lebih maju untuk menekan Myanmar. Presidennya ada, apa tanda presidennya ada yakni tidak mengambil sanksi yang diberikan kepada pimpin junta tidak mengundang mereka untuk datang. Nah, nah, saya belum punya pikiran apa uh, yang akan dilakukan oleh Indonesia uh, terkait untuk menekan Myanmar. Tapi dari apa yang telah disampaikan oleh Presiden Joko Widodo dan Menteri Luar Negeri uh, Ratno yang dia sendiri bilang bahwa uh, Sosial info nanti dari ASEAN, dari, apa, ASEAN mencari mensi akan dipimpin oleh Menteri Luar Negeri, berarti, berarti, dia, berarti dia sendiri. Maka saya berpikir bahwa langkah yang akan dilakukan mungkin akan lebih progresif dari yang sekarang. Walaupun saya tidak bisa begitu um, butuh yakin ya, karena apa? Karena di ASEAN sendiri uh, ada Laos, ada Kamboja, dan mungkin juga Thailand yang tidak begitu sejalan dengan Indonesia, Malaysia, atau Singapura dalam melihat uh, Myanmar ini. Nah, uh, mungkin saya tidak akan terlalu lama lagi. Saya ingin sampaikan bahwa mekanisme 
di dalam ASEAN itu tidak terlalu bisa diharapkan eh, karena apa karena memang eh, ASEAN tidak didesain untuk eh, menekan anggotanya untuk patuh kepada sistem yang mereka buat dalam hal ini adalah ASEAN Charter. Yang kedua kalau kita pergi ke UN eh, mekanisme UN eh, apa UN eh, mekanisme juga tidak begitu mengembirakan karena apa karena eh, Penentu akhir dari intervensi dalam hal ini, jika semua upaya tidak berhasil dilakukan, termasuk misalnya sanksi ter ter terkait dengan ekonomi, itu tidak bisa dilakukan kalau UN Security Council tidak menyetujuinya. UN Security Council tidak menyetujui sangat besar kemungkinannya karena apa? Karena di UN Security Council ada sistem pengambilan keputusan namanya. Uh, Hal itu semua lima negara pemegang hal itu harus setuju. Di antara lima negara itu ada satu negara namanya Cina kita tahu semua itu dan Cina sangat dekat dengan uh, Myanmar. Saya sangat meyakini jika negara-negara lain anggota Dewan Keamanan akan mengusulkan suatu resolusi yang akan menekan Myanmar, saya tidak begitu yakin uh, itu akan didukung oleh Cina. Jadi uh, jika ASEAN sangat mendesak, mendesak Myanmar untuk melakukan pekerjaannya, bagaimana yang diminta oleh lima poin konsensus tadi, dan ASEAN tidak, Myanmar tidak mau. Jika misalnya, misalnya ASEAN kemudian mensuspend keanggotaan dari Myanmar, walaupun ini tentu tidak ada di ASEAN Charter, maka saya yakin Myanmar akan semakin dekat ke China dan dia akan bersandar kepada China. Dan ini uh, tidak tidak diinginkan juga oleh negara-negara uh, ASEAN sendiri. Nah, jadi uh, saya sendiri tidak begitu yakin dengan apa yang akan dilakukan oleh Indonesia, uh, tapi saya merasa bahwa uh, Indonesia punya agenda tersendiri yang berupaya untuk menekan Myanmar, tidak tidaknya untuk patuh kepada uh, apa uh, lima uh, poin konsensus tadi. Nah sedikit lagi, eh, tadi juga disebut bahwa ada mekanisme eh, pertanggungjawaban individual ya bagi tinggi-tinggi eh, junta jika mereka apa namanya eh, pergi ke luar negeri. Ya ada ada namanya universal jurisdiction di mana negara-negara yang di dalam hukum pidananya mengatur bahwa jika individu melakukan pelanggaran hak asasi manusia dalam hal ini misalnya genocide, crime against humanity dan war crime. Oh ya, jangan lupa juga sekarang di Myanmar kita percaya sudah terjadi konflik bersenjata dengan demikian hukum humanitar berlaku. Maka negara yang memiliki universal jurisdiction dapat menangkap, dapat memposisikan pemimpin junta yang patut diduga telah melakukan kejahatan terhadap kemanusiaan. Dan diharapkan juga ya Indonesia um, bisa mengubah undang-undang pengadilan HAM sehingga pelanggaran genosida, pelanggaran crimes against humanity tidak hanya undang-undang um, tadi tidak hanya menjerat pelanggaran crimes against humanity, genosida dan walaupun sekarang belum ada war crime di Indonesia, tapi juga pelanggaran itu bisa dilakukan oleh uh, orang lain dimanapun dia berada. Sehingga mungkin ini bisa jadi salah satu uh, apa ya uh, warning kepada siapapun di ASEAN jika Anda melakukan pelanggaran hak asasi manusia yang berat, um, diharapkan dengan ada undang-undang baru di Indonesia pelanggaran itu bisa diadili. Um, saya pikir undang-undang itu bisa menjawab uh, pertanyaan. Terima kasih. Ya, Terima kasih Pak Irfan. Uh, ya tadi sudah dijelaskan uh, saya akan berbahasa Indonesia kali ini karena tadi Pak Irfan berbahasa Indonesia uh, bahwa ada beberapa hal yang sebenarnya sudah ada di dalam mekanisme uh, PBB tapi memang seperti yang kita tahu bahwa di dalam PBB sendiri itu juga ada banyak sekali hambatan salah satunya dengan adanya hak veto sama dengan halnya di ASEAN bahwa kita punya yang namanya konsensus yang dimana salah satu negaranya adalah negara yang berkonflik jadi ya selama tidak konsensus maka tidak ada uh, sebuah mekanisme yang cukup bisa mengikat gitu ya terkait soal situasi hak asasi manusia dan ini sangat bertentangan sebenarnya dengan uh, prinsip hak asasi manusia itu sendiri. 
begitu. Nah, jadi selain itu juga um, Pak Irfan tadi sudah menjelaskan bahwa memang ASEAN tidak punya yang namanya legally binding mechanism gitu di uh, terkait soal hak asasi manusia di regional uh, ASEAN. Di mana itu juga menjadi salah satu kelemahan uh, di ASEAN sendiri sehingga apa yang terucap ataupun tertulis di dalam ASEAN Charter ataupun uh, ASEAN Declaration on Human Rights itu hanyalah sebagai formalitas, mekanisme-mekanisme formalitas yang sebetulnya juga tidak cukup efektif dalam merespon uh, atau menjawab situasi-situasi konflik dan situasi-situasi uh, impunitas dan pelanggaran HAM yang terjadi di regional ini begitu. Dan ya uh, Adapun bagaimana sebetulnya uh, universal jurisdiction yang tadi terakhir ya menarik dijelaskan adalah bahwa uh, Indonesia memang tidak memiliki mekanisme uh, universal jurisdiction sampai dengan hari ini dan kita tahu bahwa ada beberapa lembaga yang sedang melakukan judicial review terkait soal universal jurisdiction ini dan harapannya ini juga bisa dikabulkan oleh uh, Mahkamah Konstitusi ya supaya uh, salah satunya ini dapat menjadi sebuah kesempatan dan juga salah satu bentuk konkret bagi pemerintah Indonesia apabila ini di, di apa dikabulkan oleh MK ketika uh, universitas jurisdiksi ini dapat uh, diaplikasikan di negara kita sehingga kita tidak hanya menghormati dan melindungi um, dan juga memenuhi hak asasi manusia termasuk soal pelanggaran HAM berat yang terjadi di ranah nasional tetapi juga di ranah internasional. Oke, okay. saya akan kembali berbahasa Inggris. Mohon maaf interpreternya jadi muter-muter. Selanjutnya, uh, the next I would like to give the floor to Alvin Omar. Uh, as our last online uh, participant uh, or online speaker that uh, joining with us uh, today. And please share your thoughts and then all, all of the concerns that um, you've been uh, discussing and then also working right now related to the conflict in Myanmar. And then how uh, we've seen that a lot of like um, apathetic coming from the, people, the public that Uh, the international mechanism is not really answering the, the situation in Myanmar, and then how uh, the situation of Myanmar is not really settling, because, I don't know, probably because ASEAN is one of the epicentrum of economic development, and that's why the international government are not really uh, taking care or putting a lot of attention in Myanmar situation, not like the other conflict uh, situation, or how It is because that the ASEAN countries are not really putting the situation of conflict in the international level as well. So probably can share the situation and then how uh, we as the ASEAN people that could uh, working together in solidarity for the situation in Myanmar. The place is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, organizing also this event and also having me. And I am really um, grateful for our uh, colleagues in uh, um, in Indonesia, long-term friends in solidarity with our Myanmar people's long struggle for democracy and human rights. So I'm also very honored to be having this space together with Dadu Safuddin as well. Uh, Dadu, thank you, thank you so much for your uh, continuing encouragement and trust in Myanmar people's uh, de uh, determination and struggle for the change. Your leadership and your encouragement, your support really means a lot to us. Um, if I may go ahead and start uh, saying that us as the Myanmar people, we have a high expectation uh, during this year um, from ASEAN. To be very frankly, it's because Indonesia is cheering. Um, also because the 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 ASEAN five point consensus um, that has that was actually initiated by Indonesia president, and are now after two years, as I Shonlet put it very clearly and and rightly, that that has already failed. Um, so the time the timing of where the crisis of the Myanmar people on the ground and the timing of the Indonesia, you know, taking the chairmanship in the in the block. I think, um, you know, it, it is natural for us uh, to think 
and and expect so much from Indonesia. But of course, we also understand the um the limitations and restrictions, especially when we are well aware of the fact that there is no common political position um, or a collective political position among the nine uh, ASEAN member states. I think that was clear to us when Thailand actually invited the military hunters foreign minister to, uh, to have this meeting last month it was it it became it became more obvious for us that there are certain member states who continue to be dwelling on the you know this uh thinking that this this Myanmar as a country and the beat the, the the people are now as if that you know the people are under the military i think the especially like a a, a country a neighboring country like thailand we trust that they know, but probably they just don't want to know. But in that kind of like a, you know, like a, this um, a dynamics and different approach within the uh, the regional bloc, uh, like Sean has said, you know, five point consensus has failed. So why not actually abandon the, those failed five point consensus and actually try to uh, have a new set of a consensus or a new set of you know, like calling as a five point consensus is a bit already a problematic since the beginning for us, because the five point consensus was not actually, uh, you know, since the day one didn't include the legitimate uh, leaders or the legitimate representatives of the country concern. Yeah. So uh, we like uh, Dado Savude was talking about then national univer national unity government's foreign minister being you know, humbly uh, saying that, you know, like these five point consensus were not sufficient. I think for us as civil society, we were very bold and, you know, like uh, being honest since the day one that those five points are going to fail because, you know, when you look at and how the, the uh, not only the five point composition and the, 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 the substance in it to address the crisis is not only insufficient, but also the process itself was, you know, it really fell short of what it needed to be for a, 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 a delegate um, uh, political process that it should set out. So I think these are the things that we now, that the time has come for us to look into. Um, with that, what I would like to actually share with you is something that, um, uh, from our civil society side that we have made some concrete proposals to the ASEAN, uh, especially in this 2023, uh, when Indonesia is chairing the bloc. We know that Indonesia is not alone. We know that Dusafuddin and Malaysia, even the uh, new prime minister is you know, like able to see that and 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 able to speak out publicly on what needs to be addressed, right? So Indonesia has great allies. The same, you know, like those who didn't attend uh, uh, Thailand's, you know, meeting, Thailand organized meeting last month that include Singapore, that includes um, uh, Philippines, for example. So Singapore, Singapore, Philippines. So there are a few of these um, allies within the regional bloc, which I feel that, you know, this is something that Indonesia and Malaysia, along with Malaysia, of course. So, so the, there is a way that Indonesia can actually uh, maneuver or take new approach and take new steps. I think that's something that we are looking for, but in that uh, something new that we are looking for or, uh, or expecting from Indonesia includes this. We propose a set of propose, uh, a concrete actions that uh, we think that Indonesia, uh, it's important for Indonesia to look, uh, to, 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 to take uh, one, definitely includes, of course, to start with is looking at this five point consensus, yeah? So these five point consensus, of course, we, we are well aware of the United Nations, including the UN Secretary, uh, UN uh, Security Council resolution on Myanmar adopted last month in December, mention or uh, recognize or adopted the five point ASEAN consensus. Other UN resolutions on Myanmar in the last two years also supported the five point consensus from the ASEAN. 
other regional blocs, including like, you know, African Union also uh, support because that they are supporting the regional blocs role to address a member state affairs or the crisis. So there are a lot of these political support surrounding this failed five white consensus. And therefore, we know it's challenging for ASEAN with the internal dynamics as well as the external factors to even perhaps you know to think of a new set of uh, a new set of solution for Myanmar. Maybe that might the, the Indonesia and ASEAN member states might find it challenging or probably not ready yet at this point. But I think our proposal that we made before the uh, the summit in November last November was for the ASEAN leaders. Uh, to actually review these five point consensus and amend as needed. At least that should be a minimum a, a minimum benchmark for the, uh, the Indonesia chairmanship in 2023 to start with to address the situation. That five point consensus review and amendment needs to actually include the legal, uh, legitimate leaders of the country, namely the NUG, NUCC, and ethnic revolutionary organizations. And that is something that we want to see the Indonesia kick off as a first step before, um, in like a, uh, before uh, you get into the anniversary of the second, second anniversary of the, uh, the five point consensus, which is going to be in April, right? So that is something that we would like for Indonesia to do. But when we say like, you know, like include NUG and UCC EROs and engage with these legitimate leaders of the country concern, meaning that we would like to see Indonesia formally inviting these entities, formally. We don't want Indonesia going back door, knocking the back door of the NUG quietly and having a quiet conversation. That doesn't work in this kind of, you know, especially in this kind of context. We want Indonesia to Indonesia leadership to be transparent of the process that they do, tra be transparent to the public, especially to the people of Myanmar and to the people of Indonesia and the, to, to the people of ASEAN. I think that's what we are looking for. And I hope that also is something that we could actually make it, you know, clear to the Indonesian uh, government, Ibu Ratno, together with all of you. That's one thing. The other is also we call for Indonesia and ASEAN to stop inviting or discontinue inviting the military hunters representatives. Yes, of course, we know that ASEAN took the unprecedented step disinviting the political representation of the military hunter, starting from the leader of the uh, military uh, coup attempted uh, uh, coup attempt chief may online yes that is recognized however we also see the non political representatives of the military hunter first they are still not representing the Myanmar people's interest or the will they are in fact are representing the hunter's interest in that what they are doing also by coming to attend these all of these meetings, they are grabbing the political legitimacy for this military hunter that they desperate they desperate that desperately want and seeking where they just don't have and get it from the Myanmar people. So with that, there's something it really alarms me now. I'm going to share with you now. It's because I really thought like you know like Indonesia it would be so good to have Indonesia internally have a, con like a, a co cohesive, you know, cohesive uh, policy within Indonesia to deal with the Myanmar crisis. Now it gives me some uh, worry and doubt whether it lacks. I'll tell you why. Because I just learned the Indonesia is inviting the Myanmar military hunters uh, representative to the upcoming tourism, ASEAN tourism ministry meeting which is going to be starting on February 1, February 2, which is the time when the Myanmar people are actually commemorating of the, the, the loss of the lives and all of these torture and massacres and mass killings and rape and all of these, you know, like a military's uh, atrocity crimes. Yeah. But why are we seeing Indonesia inviting the Myanmar hunters representative on this tourism 
to attend this meeting. So I think this is one thing that I, I would like to also uh, come to seek your solidarity to raise our voice collectively and officially to the Indonesian government. I think this, this meeting, like uh, the military hunter being invited to such meeting is not only the, the, the political legitimacy it's not only the political legitimacy, but you see the tourism is a sector where the hunter is attempting to gain the legitimacy. In addition to the legitimacy, this is also a source of foreign currency to finance its act of terror against the people. This is not the time for the leisure and you know vacation in a country like Myanmar. So Indonesia needs to step up. I think Indonesia needs also a cohesive policy. So with that, what I want to say is the next my pro concrete proposal is because of this uh, military's violence across the country in different parts, we are facing a humanitarian catastrophe. And this catastrophe that we have been walking by people, people among the people by ourselves without the UN agencies and big, big aid international uh, uh, humanitarian organizations support, we've been doing effectively. But we know we can do more effectively and more sustainably if we get the support from political support from Indonesia and ASEAN, at least from Indonesian government, Malaysian government, but also if we can have a people to people solidarity approach to address the humanitarian crisis together with all of you, uh, the, solid, the, the civil society like in Malaysia, Indonesia, together with us. So these are some of the concrete proposals, not all, but some of the concrete proposals that we have made to the Indonesian government in the chairmanship time in 2023. So I will just uh, stop here, but just to respond to the chair as a, a, in the introduction, I think individual countries, in, like individually countries like Indonesia and Malaysia in, and Singapore also can take the lead in addressing the uh, issue of the military, I mean, sorry, the issue of the business uh, business sectors, private sectors, business sectors uh, being complicit or having the risk in compliciting the military atrocity crimes in Myanmar with their investment that where the financial flow is actually aiding and abetting the military to continue this uh, war of terror against the people. I think this is something we will, we can also, we would like to see the individual uh, ASEAN member states starting from Indonesia and Malaysia also address this issue from the private sector involvement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Kinoma. Um, yeah, so uh, I think because of the time constraint, I would not uh, actually be um, giving any conclusion or reviewing what uh, Kinoma already mentioned. But there are several recommendations that uh, you know are already mentioning about how Indonesia should be really brave to actually review and then not to be inviting the Hutna military again coming to Indonesia. Because last time we also protesting about that issue. And then also for Mali inv uh, inviting NUG not as in a behind door um, meeting, but also uh, it should be formally invited and be uh, concluded. In, uh, within uh, the forum in the uh, ASEAN Summit as well. And so our last speaker, this is uh, actually like a guest star because we... <laughs> but Luna, you know, perhaps you could actually share your uh, perspective and then also your thoughts related to the Indonesian chairmanship and then what's your hope and since you were a former AHA Center Director, probably you can also share some experience and then how we as an ASEAN people could collaborate together. So, bless you. Thank you very much, uh, Hatia. Um, I wasn't ready to speak, uh, uh, but I'm always uh, happy at, uh, being, being one of the silent organizer and also supporter of the young people. I was ready to actually uh, do it to Uri Handayani, meaning supporting from behind. But uh, it's okay. Uh, I'm happy to uh, have a few remarks. But I, I just noticed uh, Fati, uh, noticed Fati that uh, Dato raised his hand. Perhaps we can invite Dato first. Dato, yes, please. Oh, he's leaving. <laughs> okay. In that case, uh, 
uh, let me share my thoughts. But thank you, first of all, Gentera Law School for having this and also for Contas and the other organizer for organizing this. This is what I have wanted actually for quite uh, some time. Because I thought that if it is quite difficult to mobilize government to government channel uh, and other channels, other diplomacy channels, then uh, we should actually be more united uh, and cohesive in terms of mobilizing people to people support. It is known as the track three. But I also believe that uh, when it comes to um, fight against any uh, crimes against human humanity, uh, and uh, uh, any violation of human rights, we should not only exercise one channel or one track, we should uh, exercise all multiple tracks available out there and all platforms. And uh, since Indonesia is uh, a big country, we are, I guess we are the largest democracy in the Southeast Asian region, and perhaps one of the most mature democracy in Southeast Asia, having gone through the fight against dictatorship ourselves for over, for over 30 years. And it was actually the young people who fought against that dictatorship. And that kind of like gave hope to the Myanmar people. And if we are looking at who are fighting for democracy in Myanmar are the young are the young people. So I think this is why the expectation of Indonesia chairmanship is uh, pretty high because, uh, because we are ourselves a large democracy. And as a large democracy, we should not set the bar too low. We should actually set examples for other colleagues in ASEAN and other democracy out there around the world. What, what democracy means to Indonesia and what democracy means to ASEAN based on our own standards, not other standards based on our standards. And we know what is right, right? So that's one. Second, I think having been ASEAN, Dato uh, Saifuddin himself was the former um, foreign minister. I was in ASEAN Secretariat, Secretariat Fatia for 22 years. And then after that, I led the AHA Center as executive director uh, for five years. So collectively, almost three decades in ASEAN. So it's not easy for me to listen to the criticism on ASEAN because I have seen ASEAN progress quite significantly. While we were only five and then Brunei joined, when I joined ASEAN, it was only six of us and then others joined, right? And then Myanmar was one of the countries that I visited. And then I was in Myanmar after second Argis, and then after that, Myanmar opened up. And Myanmar people were able to see that, that Myanmar, that they're, they're not alone. Uh, so that there were this period of time when the Myanmar people could, could sense a sight of hope. But that at the slat of hope now disappear. What are we going to do about it? I think for Indonesia, for ASEAN, we should no longer we should no longer be looking at our past for our for our limitation that, that uh, we don't have this so-called crisis mechanism. I wrote about it in Jakarta Post in October 2021 after I left the AHA Center. But ASEAN. It's not having right now, it's not only crisis mechanism for dealing with the human rights crisis and violation, but also how to provide humanitarian assistance in conflict and how to actually deal with a country that uh, has uh, committed crime against humanity and uh, uh, violated against not only international law, but also the ASEAN Charter. We don't have that mechanism. But we should be now looking ahead, not looking backwards. And be more creative by having inventions and innovations. It is possible to have suspension, why not? Because we are able to ban the Myanmar junta from participation. Yes, 
but but we should not be doing it step by step anymore because it's already two years. It's enough lah as evidence. But Ivana, it's already enough, right? We have tested all the things that uh, we have uh, uh, put on the table. So my suggestion for Indonesia as the chair this year, there are five of them. Um, first, Indonesia has to work on the basis that it is. What we have right now is a long-term game, not a one-year thing. Our runway as the chair is only one year, and two summits within that one year, and several uh, foreign ministers meeting. So we could be really preparing diligently on what we can do in that within that short-term runway for the plane to take off, but. It should be strong runway that uh, whatever that Indonesia is preparing will outlast the chairmanship. And that goes back to uh, Kim Omar's suggestion for a long-term plan or what that was said within a set about a long-term game, but with clear deliverables, with clear timeline, and beyond just delivering short-term humanitarian aid and planning for visits of the special envoy. We have done it, right? And one of those clear deliverable is progress on the ground, not just dropping boxes at the airport and getting that distributed by, uh, by some uh, humanitarian agencies. Now, second, it is important that uh, Indonesia exercise its greatness as the chair of ASEAN. And that is being able to fire on all cylinders, just like a weapon, all cylinders and from different angles. And that's what I said about exercising all the tracks and multiple platforms. I think the world is paying more attention on what Indonesia will do rather than what Indonesia will do as a chair, but on what Indonesia will do as Indonesia. Because if we have a plan, it's Indonesia, right? That will actually influence others in our regional grouping. But if we are doing it from multiple tracks and multiple uh, form, that has to be coordinated. Who is coordinating that? That's the question. Third, I think we, may, we have to be firm and assertive, assertive, but also clear about our intent. There is a dilemma that if we are talking too much to the NUG and others, then the SAC will hate us and will close all the uh, channels of communication. But if we are clear about our intent, the Myanmar people, I think, will be okay the way I see it. Because they know that if some of the Indonesian are talking to the SAC, but we are also talking to the NNUG and others openly and clearly about our intent, the purpose is to have a clear communications from all channels. Okay, sorry about that uh, technical difficulty. Can I proceed? Okay, uh, uh, two more. Fourth, stop feeding the junta. <laughs> stop feeding the junta. I think uh, it is time for us to suspend uh, uh, the junta from participation, participating in ASEAN meeting. We cannot hold their hands anymore. We cannot be too nice to them anymore. And we should stop hallucinating that the military junta has good faith in humanitarian track. They are not. And that is actually our call, not only for Indonesian government and ASEAN, but for all humanitarian actors out there. Um, I'll stop at that and over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Madalina. Uh, there are five suggestions that I think this could be considered and probably could be follow up as a policy brief to the um, Indonesian chairmanship to the MOFA, actually, because so suspending the uh, military junta is one of the ways to open as an entry point, I think, to 
continue this process and then making it as a development because the thing is that we haven't had any uh, development or even like a progressive uh, impacts that could be implied to the uh, uh, Myanmar people because everything is really diplomatic and then very soft and never really having a lot of like um, significant impacts to the Myanmar people. Okay, without further ado, because this is already a past time, uh, how many uh, minutes that we have for the question and an answer? Okay. okay, we have 15 minutes uh, for questions and answers. Um, I think we have a lot of questions. Okay, 12 questions from uh, the people in the online platform. So, uh, okay, I would like to uh, reading the first one. Is AHA Center is part of this? Have they got the experience or capacity? Will Junta be involved anyway? They were in the earlier proposal for the humanitarian forum. I think this is already answered indirectly from your speech, though. No, no, not really. So, but Elena, do you can answer about this? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So maybe we can answer from the first question first. Um, thank you, uh, Fatia. Uh, for the first uh, question, actually, I I wrote about it. Uh, in was it like in November uh, last year, I presented three uh, scenarios. The first one was the top down scenario because people have been talking about these three scenarios top down uh, scenario, meaning that the international community will uh, uh, establish the so called humanitarian corridors, something like what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, but I, I argued that that will not work because for humanitarian corridors to work, it requires the uh, other uh, party, that means Myanmar Junta, to cooperate. And we know for sure that they will not cooperate, just like the Russians, right? They didn't cooperate and they don't cooperate. So top-down approach will not cooperate, uh, will not work. Second is this uh, forum, uh, in, in International Forum for Humanitarian Engagement. Uh, what uh, that is like within Abdullah mentioned, it was actually uh, initiated by uh, the NUG Ministry for Humanitarian Affairs together with uh, some uh, ethnic uh, groups. Uh, and the question is whether ASEAN has been part of it. I saw the first iteration uh, of that proposal. It mentioned that uh, AHA Center will, uh, will be invited because this uh, track will actually complement the work of uh, AHA Center. And that's uh, where the issue is, because if a passenger is included, uh, then the question is whether uh, SEAN countries, including the Myanmar junta, who is sitting as part of the decision maker right now, will allow a passenger to channel the humanitarian aid to the, uh, through the NUG and the uh, ethnic groups. Uh, so I, I don't think that that uh, work uh, either. Uh, but, but I think there has been uh, further versions, uh, development of the version. It's not too bad, actually, because uh, it actually kind of like puts a different model for people and donors in particular to concentrate that, look, uh, you, you should not channel it through the uh, uh, anymore. You are hallucinating if you are uh, doing that, right? Stop doing that and work with the energy and the ethnic groups. But I think one thing about this uh, internet, uh, the humanitarian engagement forum is that the role of the AHA Center here, and AHA Center is not uh, independent, and and therefore, uh, yeah, uh, unless unless ASEAN leaders remove the junta from the decision making, then they could work with uh, the others, right? But there is still Myanmar junta, and therefore my earlier suggestion to suspend. The Myanmar junta from all decision making, uh, including the uh, the one related to humanitarian. So I suggested in my article, look it up, published by the ECS. Uh, the third one is the locally led humanitarian action, which uh, is actually building from that forum, uh, you know, uh, created by the NUG and other ethnic groups, but really focusing on locally led humanitarian action, and then also well. I was building, I was the one, one of those who built the AHA Center and I want AHA Center to be successful. 
But we have to also realize that the center was not developed for conflict, for humanitarian assistance de uh, deliver, uh, delivered in conflict, it's for natural disasters. And we shouldn't actually uh, be with the big hearts enough to say, when it comes to humanity, when it comes to humanitarian, we should let those who are trusted by the people to deliver the aid and who are they, the local humanitarian actors. So therefore, I'm advocating for the third approach, whether or not the passenger should be in it, that depends. Is Myanmar still part of the decision-making process? If it is, better not. The, the key is that if Myanmar military junta is still part of the decision-making process, then the center could not be really effective as it should be. And uh, this, okay. Uh, ASEAN, wait, which one? Okay. What do you think of the UN engagement with SAC for access to deliver humanitarian aid? Probably I will just give um, this question and then my privilege as moderator to several of the speakers. Uh, probably um, Kin Omar and then Pak Irfan could answer this question. And then since Pak Saifuddin already no longer here, right? So Pak Irfan and then Kin Omar, probably you can answer this question. I will point the discussion to both of you. So maybe Pak Irfan first. Um. Prinsip utama dari pemberian bantuan kemanusiaan dia harus imparsial. Um, kalau tidak melibatkan junta, junta akan mengambil sikap bermusuh. Kalau melibatkan dia, uh, bantuan mungkin tidak akan sampai kepada kelompok yang tidak mendukung junta. Jadi memang agak serba salah. Um, tapi yang pasti. Harus ada kesepakatan di antara pemberi donor, entah itu UN, entah itu ASEAN, atau itu atau ASEAN yang lain, bahwa uh, ada jaminan bahwa mereka bisa menyampaikan bantuan kemanusiaannya. Dan kelompok ini, siapapun itu, mungkin ASEAN, salah satunya yang penting untuk kita uh, lihat dan penting untuk kita tinggung di sini, karena apa? Karena patut diduga. Sangat kuat, patut diduga bahwa apa yang telah terjadi di Myanmar sekarang adalah konflik senjata, dan oleh karena itu, peran dari International Committee of the Red Cross dalam memberikan bantuan kemanusiaan, termasuk juga korban perang, itu penting untuk juga menjadi pertimbangan. Karena apa? Karena situasi perang tadi. Nah, yang ingin kembali saya tegaskan bahwa sulit untuk tidak melibatkan kunta karena apa karena kalau dia tidak dilibatkan maka bisa jadi dia akan mengambil sikap kebutuhan terhadap siapapun yang akan membantu kelompok-kelompok yang memang pasti dibantu seperti misalnya bantuan kemanusiaan tadi saya pikir begitu oke okay. maybe uh, you know one can you share your perspective on this Do you think the UN engagement with SAC for the access to deliver humanitarian aid is also possible? And I think this is also related about the OCHA humanitarian response plan since it's also under the UN. So probably you can answer the, uh, that question as well. Can you know She's not responding? Okay. Tinza, are you there? I, um, I'm here, but sorry because oh, I'm the, okay. the, the the sound is quite is uh not clear, so I couldn't really grab the the, the question. Would you mind uh, yeah, repeating it for me? It's actually in the in the Zoom as well. Uh, can you? So is it, uh, is it in the in the right day? Yeah, yeah, in the Q and A, ASEAN five point. Oh. Can, cannot hear now. Mm -hmm. It's disconnected. Hello? Hello? Can you? No. Hello? 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 Can you hear me? Uh, is, it, is it in the chat box? Can we look at there? No. I don't see it. 
I'm I'm so sorry, Nova dear. I cannot hear you well. Hello, Hello? can you hear me now? now? Yes, yes, now I can hear you. Yeah. So it's in the Q&A box in Zoom. You can actually um, read that there. Okay. okay. There is one question that, what do you think of an engagement with SAC for access to deliver humanitarian aid? Oh, yes, yes, got it. Thank you, thank you so much. So sorry for the, um, yeah. So uh, this is one of the key issues that we are also dealing uh, among the Myanmar civil society organizations, local humanitarian responders, civil, uh, community-based organizations. The, our position is very clear. There is There should be absolutely no engagement with the military hunter, meaning no signing or extending of the MOUs, no signing or uh, extending, you know, like the credentials or giving the, like a signing agreement. So we don't want international agencies, UN agencies, INGOs to do that. One reason is, is of course, it's very clear because by doing so, when, you know, that the, the, the thing is, when they are signing MOUs, these UN agencies are not even having formal engagement with the legitimate stakeholders of our country. That's a huge problem. That 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 you know, like when they said they claim to be holding uh, uh, upholding the impartiality and neutrality principles, but the reality is they are being biased. They are, in fact, they are biased not to. You know they are not they are they are they are biased in in their bias is not even in the interest or for benefit of the Myanmar people. They are biased in the interest in favor of the Myanmar military. That's a problem, <laughs> you know. So what we're saying is, if you want to be neutral and and impartial, you either don't work with any of us or you work with all of us in in that sense that they just cannot because they. They, they basically, they, they really, you know, like the, uh, in their engagement is they are, they are biased in favor of the military hunter who have no legitimacy from the people, but who also created this catastrophe, humanitarian crisis. At the same time, the, 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 the hunter is the one who dictate, who dictate the, the decisions of where the, the, the aid will go to whom and, and, you know, so basically the hunter also destroys, they destroys the humanitarian aid and they attacks the humanitarian workers. So what kind of, what kind of engagement and the humanitarian delivery that they want to do? The reality is none of these UN agencies and INGOs have uh, access they don't have access to the people who are in dire needs on the ground. When we say dire needs, the population most vulnerable, lack of complete human security because they are day and night attacked by this military, you see? So that's the very reason we said, you know, that, that there should be absolutely no engagement with this military hunter. But then the next step is also what we are asking them is, of course, you know, there are programs aim for the and claim for the Myanmar people in need, right? So the Myanmar people themselves are addressing this issue together in the, you know, like a people to people way. And they need to be supporting these local humanitarian responders, you know? So basically what we are calling on them is get out of your comfort zone get out of that, you know, like a formal, you know, conventional way of humanitarian, because in context of Myanmar, that conventional way doesn't work. I think that's what we are calling for them. Don't extend the MOU, but also support the local humanitarian responders uh, efforts and initiatives on the ground, because at the end of the day, there are people, whether local or national staffs or international staffs, are not able to have access to the people who need who who need the 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 the, uh, the aid. And the other thing that we need to actually put the spotlight on is this international aid. And uh, this international aid gets in hands of the military people, where in turn military people also they corruptly sell the items on the on the on the market instead of 
you know, getting the aid, reaching to the local people in need. So these are the so many uh, factors that we need to address. And that's the very reason we said, OK, work with the, the, the national unity government, work with the EROs, sign the MOUs with the, these legitimate actors. Because after all, the reality is these legitimate uh, political entities of the of Myanmar are the one also who are doing this work on the ground, who have access to the local people. They have the administration, they have the governance, and they have the infrastructure, and they also have, you know, territorial control, you see. So I think these are the things that we are really telling. And unfortunately, unfortunately, these UN agencies think that we are actually, you know, trying to uh, 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 block or you know, like uh, disturb their work. Unfortunately, we are saying that this is about our country and our people. And we need to be able to tell you what is needed and what needs to be done. And it's not for you to dictate what you know, how the humanitarian should be delivered. It is for our people to be telling you how the humanitarian should be delivered so that our people get it as it should be. So that's where we are at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Kinomar. Okay, well, because this is all very last minute as it's actually already past our time. So I would uh, like to actually put another question from uh, the Q&A uh, columns here. So I will pick like the top one. Uh, the, the greatest humorous defender are PDF. Why are they not supported? And then also including, if ASEAN is not fit for the purpose of dealing with conflict, why have the distraction uh, and in the ASEAN involvement? So I would like to give this floor to uh, Yasmin and then also to uh, Tanzir to actually answer these questions. So yeah, for our last, uh, opportunity of the question and answer for Yasmin and uh, Tanzir, and then after that we can have a closing remark. Oh, Yasmin is not here. Okay, maybe Tanzir, can you give your perspective on these questions and then after that we can have closing remarks. Tanzir, Tanzir, sorry. Tanzir. Shinley, are you here? Oh yes, I was. I was listening, but actually, yeah, that the, there is a lot of echo, and I couldn't hear. So, yeah, can yeah. you still hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, if the uh, human rights defenders are PDF, why are they are not supported? And then ASEAN is not privy to the proposed for dealing conflict. So, why have this section in talking about ASEAN involvement? So, maybe you can answer that question. Uh, you mean why as okay? So you are saying ASEAN is not fit for purpose of dealing with conflict. So why have the distraction and screen of Poco ASEAN involvement? Oh, I see. The greater US provider are the yeah, why are why are they not supported? Um thank you. Um so so uh from my perspective, um the the greatest human rights defender, whoever they are, regardless of PDF or the civilians, or even, you know, women's human rights defender or Rohingya, they are all under, you know, uh, threats in all successive governments. So um, that also applies to many different governments as well. And now the same. So the PDF people, they are the young people, right? So they, they were defending the communities. Now they are defending the... Uh, the federal units, a uh, small federal unit in different townships, in different areas, so that the people can protest peacefully, uh, uh, people can um, start thinking about accountability, start thinking about justice system, start thinking about education, they are providing uh, different services um, that are, um, that they can't get access from the Honda. So, um, yeah. they are not supported. Hello? Yeah. Uh, your your voice is uh disturbed. Can you can you that again? Uh, sorry, let me um okay. Hello. What about yeah, yeah, it's better. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was saying all the human rights defender, regardless of who they are, you know, they are the um they are seen as a threat in different communities. That and that's also what. I'm worried the most at the same time in different community, including in, even in the revolutionary settings that um, 
uh, that that our revolution must uh, based on the human rights principle and democratic principle. So now we got that vacuum, right? The vacuum um, window period that we, we see, we don't have any more of um, 2008 uh, influence over our thinking because in the past, um, we have a lot of influence from the 2008 constitution that if you like to um, uh, advocate for human rights, uh, free and expressions or whatever that is. And people say, the parliamentarians say, oh, that that is already said, the mother law say no. And mother law say we have to abide by this and that. But now the revolution has already uh, declared we don't have to say constitution, we don't recognize this anymore. So that gives us more freedom to build foundation for human rights and democracy in the region, in the country. So this is why um, we need more support for these um, PDF people and also uh, on the ground that, that these uh, our our uh, local democracy defender, human rights defender are way uh, informed about human rights principles. So that's that's this is how I think we should support to these uh, grassroots community, including civil societies. So for the second, um, so for the second question, any Omar we can respond to this? Yes. Shall I take now? Yes, yes please. Yes, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you for the question. So basically, um, when we say that our the you know like a current ASEAN five point consensus failed, uh, but the thing is, as uh, Myanmar is a member of ASEAN, as a regional bloc, ASEAN has the responsibility has the responsibility to deal with Myanmar, uh, to address this crisis and also to basically to protect the people of Myanmar from such harms and atrocity crimes and violence this military is inflicting on the people, right? The thing is also, of course, you know, being the regional bloc, ASEAN also has many um, work in progress and work in, at, uh, in work plan in place, work in progress for the regional development, politically, economically, socially, you know, culturally, like, in, like coming into, this one community. But the thing is, Myanmar, ever since Myanmar was uh, uh, Myanmar uh, was uh, welcomed to be a member back in 1996, the, if you look at the, 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 the regional uh, blocks, you know, like a, like a different regional plan to advance, including human rights protection, you know, like, like well, uh, economic development, even look at that. The, all of these plans, are deterred or delayed or disturbed and disrupted is because also there's a lot of a lot of this uh, spillover effects from Myanmar with the re the the, the uh, non-stopping uh, refugee crisis, like you know non-stopping uh, uh, undocumented migrant workers, you know uh, coming into like you know Thailand and Malaysia, and, and you see that this you know, so basically this human lack of human security in Myanmar is impacting the regional security as well. So regardless of whether Myanmar crisis, whether ASEAN you know, uh, uh, capacity fits to address Myanmar crisis or not, ASEAN is bound to be and obliged to be addressing the Myanmar crisis. But the question that we have now that we have posed is how ASEAN is going to address that, yeah? So in that how is what we are proposing first, Ever since the day one of the five point consensus, we said ASEAN alone, no matter what kind of mechanisms ASEAN has, even if ASEAN has a concrete mechanisms and policies like African Union, even like, you know, like a, a regional human rights mechanism, like American, uh, you know, like a, a, a American continent. The reality is ASEAN alone cannot deal with the Myanmar crisis because it's multifaceted, multidimensional. And also it's really caught by, caused by this military who is actually is uh, uh, accused before their world codes, you know, for their uh, international crimes, yeah? So for that, what ASEAN should be doing is reaching out to the like-minded partners or the like-minded countries, especially, particularly reaching out to the UN Security Council to get the council to act and, and reaching out to the, uh, uh, Secretary General of the United Nations to join in that political effort rather than ASEAN taking this, you know, like a board at the court, at the, at the upfront of the court alone, when everybody is kind of 
uh, hiding behind ASEAN as if like, you know, they're giving the ASEAN a leadership. But the, no, that the, the, the reality is ASEAN should not be given stand alone leadership because ASEAN doesn't have the capacity. So that's why we are saying this, that ASEAN itself, uh, like Shola uh, 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 said, said it clearly, ASEAN first, it, uh, ASEAN first and foremost should be, it should have the courage to accept and, and announce and say that five point consensus failed. Second, let's take the next step. Let's take the next step together with the legitimate leaders of this country so that the address is solved together with the people from the ground, you see? But I think that's where these loopholes and the shortfalls in the ASEAN's approach, which is something that we are proposing to the Indonesia don't please let's not continue this playbook playbook you know again and again that, that already failed uh so let's come up with a new um strategic approach together with the country stakeholders so that the ASEAN is do will be able to do will be able to carry out the due responsibility as a regional bloc but also not allowing the military to to hold hostage not allowing the military to hold ASEAN hostage continually. I think that's the point we are making. I hope you get it clearly. Thank you so much for this question. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Kinova. And can I have an applause for uh, all of the very amazing description and explanation from all participants and all speakers and a very good questions coming from the participants here. And since the time constraint, I will not ask for the closing remarks from each speakers, but I would like to thank you all for all of your um, contribution in this public discussion. It really means a lot, and I think some of the pointers from the speakers are, uh, can be followed up for our next advocacy process in the ASEAN level, and I hope that Indonesia do concerning and do have a concretely response to the uh, Myanmar situation and then also all the, the situation of conflict in ASEAN. And I hope the Indonesian chairmanship could actually become one of the entry point and then also as a breakthrough and in the human rights um, arena in ASEAN, which we know that is not really progressive for the last uh, five decades, I think. And I hope it could be reviewed and it could be evaluated so it would be better in the future for our human rights situation in the region. Thank you very much, Mbak Adelina, Pak Irfan, and all of the contribution from uh, Omar, uh, Tinzar as well, and then Yasmin and Pak uh, uh, Saifuddin for all of the uh, very uh, good contribution and then all uh, organizing committee that already uh, make this uh, public discussion happen. Uh, as a moderator, I would like to also uh, thank you and apologies if there is any uh, anything that is not really went well uh, from my end. So thank you very much and see you guys as well in the next agenda. Bye. -bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Everyone.